Since I hold that science exists solely in the self-movement of the notion and since my view differs from, and is in fact wholly opposed to, current ideas regarding the nature and form of truth, both those referred to above and other peripheral aspects of them, it seems that any attempt to expound the system of science from this point of view is unlikely to be favorably received. In the meantime, I can bear in mind that if at times the excellence of Plato's philosophy has been held to lie in his scientifically valueless myths, there have also been times, even times of ecstatic dreaming, when Aristotle's philosophy was, was esteemed for its speculative depth and Plato's Parmenides, surely the greatest artistic achievement of the ancient dialectic, was regarded as a true disclosure and positive expression of the divine life, and times when, despite the obscurity generated by ecstasy, this misunderstood ecstasy was in fact supposed to be nothing else than the pure notion. Furthermore, what is really excellent, in, what really is excellent in the philosophy of our time takes its value to lie in its scientific quality, and even though others take a different view, it is in fact only in virtue of its scientific character that it exerts any influence. Hence, I may hope, too, that this attempt to vindicate science for the notion and to expound it in this, this its proper element, will succeed in winning, winning acceptance through the inner truth of the subject matter. We must hold to the conviction that it is the nature of truth to prevail when its time has come, and that it appears only when this time has come, and therefore never appears prematurely, nor finds a public not ripe to receive it. Also, we must accept that the individual needs, that this should be so in order to verify what is as yet a matter for himself alone, and to experience the conviction, which in the first place belongs only to a particular individual, as something universally held. But in this connection, the public must often be distinguished from those who pose as its representatives and spokesmen. In many respects, the attitude of the public is quite different from, even contrary to, that of these spokesmen. Whereas the public is inclined good-naturedly to blame itself when a philosophical work makes no appeal to it, these others, certain of their own competence, put all the blame on the author. The effect of such a work on the public is more noiseless than the action of these dead men when they bury their dead. The general level of insight now is altogether more educated, its curiosity more awake, and its judgment more swiftly reached, so that the feet of those who will carry you out are already at the door. But from this, we must often distinguish the more gradual effect which corrects the attention exhorted by imposing assurances and corrects to contemptuous censure and give some writers an audience only after a time, while others, after a time, have no audience left. In this penultimate paragraph of the preface, number 71, Hegel is once again situating his own work, his own project, his own approach in relation to the demands of his time, but also, like I put here, in relation to his predecessors in, in philosophy. And he's calling our attention to multiple ways of, of seeing the same thing. He's talking about the opportuneness of the historical moment that he is, is inhabiting and within which he is you know, bringing together all of these various threads into one single, not necessarily harmonious, uh, is, is with, without any discordances, but one single unified work, uh, one single unified philosophy. He's also thinking a lot about the reception that this work is likely to find, and he's kind of heading his critics off at the pass. Um, it's, it's a good rhetorical trick, actually, to say, oh, you know, I know that you're going to say this sort of thing about my work, uh, because you're that kind of person and that's really not something good in a way to get critics to say no, 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 I, I would never say that sort of thing. Um, so he's, he's cautioning us here. It's a little tongue-in-cheek. It's a little bit, you know, manipulative in a way. But he is actually getting at something that, that is quite real. So he says, since I hold that science exists solely in the self-movement of the notion, so I've got this right here, the self-development, the self-movement, um, science consists solely in that. There's other things that are called sciences that are scientific, but they're not science, capital S, Wissenschaft, 
in the Hegelian sense, if they're not fully self-aware of their own development, of their own relation to everything else, and that, that's a problem for, for quite, a, uh, quite a few modern sciences. So he says, my view differs from, and is in fact wholly opposed to, current ideas regarding the nature and form of truth. Interestingly, that sentence remains true today. Hegel is quite opposed to a variety of different uh, ideas, current ideas regarding the nature and form of truth, whether it's those in analytic philosophy or those in other continental philosophy, um, those in you know American pragmatism, those in in you know various critiques, those espoused by different relativists, different dogmatists. Hegel is still kind of an odd bird out when it comes to this sort of thing. And he says, uh, since my view differs from these other current ideas, it seems that any attempt to expound the system of science from this point of view is unlikely to be favorably received. Now, he, you know, as a side note, he enjoyed immense success for, for quite some time, lasting all the way until his death in the, uh, you know, early part of the the 19th century. I mean, he almost made it to the midpoint, not quite. And if we look at the 19th century and, and philosophical development, um, not so much in England until around the turn of the century, but in it, certainly in Germany, also influencing what was going on in Italy, influencing what was going on in France, and also influencing what was going on in America, since um, a lot of American... Uh, philosophy at a certain point started to take its cue from what was going on in German philosophy, and they started sending people over to Germany to, to get graduate degrees. Hegel is actually going to become quite an important thinker, and not just because people are becoming Hegelians in the sense of, you know, just following the system and we need to f just fill in the gaps. There, there were some right Hegelians who were like that, but uh, people found his dialectical philosophy a very useful, very powerful way of understanding reality. So he influences people ranging from the St. Louis Hegelians to Josiah Royce to Victor Cousin to Maurice Blondel um, and, you know, the British Hegelians as well. He influences a lot of people. Let me put it to you this way. He catches on so well, at least at a superficial level, that he becomes the guy, the system to react against. If we're talking about the existentialists, if we're talking about uh, British uh, analytic philosophy, they're both reactions to Hegelianism. Marxism is a reaction against Hegelianism from within, turning Hegel on its head. So, you know, any attempt to expound the system of science from this point of view unlikely to be favorably received? Well, he was, he was not quite correct about that. But, there are a lot of people who say, I just can't understand this Hegel guy. As a matter of fact, I, I used to have a uh, German philosophy professor when I was an undergraduate who said, when I, when I have insomnia, I just get out my Hegel and I start reading that and pretty soon I fall and right asleep because I can't make any sense of it and it just kind of lulls me into... Uh, uh, Somnolence. So he says, here's how I can console myself. There has been previous scientific philosophy, not as fully developed as what I'm doing, but there have been other people doing things like this along the way. And he gives the example of Plato and Aristotle. He says, I can bear in mind that if at times the excellence of Plato's philosophy has been held to line as scientifically valueless myths. He's taking a pretty strong stance on Plato there. There have also been times, even called times of ecstatic dreaming, when Aristotle's philosophy was esteemed for its speculative depth. Hegel really does take quite a bit from Aristotle, including his you know, notion of, of not causality as the four causes, but the notion of causality as we can always find some sort of reasoning process that we can make sense of, even in what appears to be merely random events, you know, Tuche in, in Aristotle's term, um, there, are, there are causalities at work, they're just complex causalities. He also, you know, takes the notion of teleology uh, full bore from Aristotle. Uh, teleology introduces notions of perfection, of moving towards some sort of end or goal, 
of organisms as being these collections of processes that are brought under one sort of unifying uh, being, a unifying node in it. Um, some of this is mediated a bit through Leibniz, you, you might say. And he says, um, Plato's Parmenides, and here Hegel says, surely the greatest artistic achievement of the ancient dialectic. Interesting thing to say, isn't it? Which of Plato's works is Hegel focusing on the most? It's not the Republic, it's not the Symposium, it's not some of the others that people take as being sort of the high point. Um, you know, who are, the, you know, who are the, the ones that the Plato aficionados really latch on to? Well, you know, if you're into rhetoric, the Gorgias or the Phaedrus, the Phaedo, um, the Sophist. No, it's the Parmenides. Why? Because the Parmenides actually shows a dialectic at work. Uh, he says... It was regarded, these were regarded as the true disclosure and positive expression of what? Of philosophy? No, of the divine life, of what was best, of what was greatest, what was most real. And times when despite obscurity generated by ecstasy, this misunderstood ecstasy was in fact supposed to be nothing other than the pure notion. That's the, the low point that's possible, right? So he says, what is really excellent in the philosophy of our time takes its value to lie in its scientific quality. Even though others take a different view, it's in fact only in virtue of its scientific character that it exerts any influence. Now why is that? You have a variety of different viewpoints in modernity that you can take on and, and think about and, and look at. Why pay attention to any given one of them over others? Could be because it appeals to your emotions, to your sound common sense. Could be that it's what you're familiar with, what you're comfortable with. Or it could be because it actually works, because it, it's tied in with the way things truly are, or it's closer to the way things truly are, and it gives you handles by which you can make sense of things. And we're not just talking about sort of application of technology, you know, understand in order to control, you know, the modern scientific viewpoint on, 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 on uh, physical reality. We're also talking about the self. We're also talking about the person. We're also talking about society writ large. We're talking about how we make sense of our past, how we make sense of our current possibilities and our future. Does a philosophy provide us with something that works, that is useful in those circumstances. If it does, according to Hegel, it's going to be because it has some sort of scientific, in the, the sense that he means scientific, scientific basis. It's going to uh, exert its influence that way. So he says, I may hope, too, that this attempt to vindicate science for the notion and to expound it in its proper element will succeed in winning acceptance through the inner truth of its subject matter. What's the proof of, of the, the phenomenology? Going through it and seeing that his analyses are actually on track. Hegel's willing to actually lay it all on the table and, and engage in one big bet and say, if you go through this and you find that it's all garbage, or you find that it's half garbage, then I didn't do my job then I wasn't really doing science. This raises some interesting questions because, you know, for somebody like me who doesn't actually agree with all of Hegel's analyses in here, um, what, what do we make of Hegel? Do we say that, well, Hegel, you know, threw it all on the table and engaged in, in one big stake, it all goes down or it all goes up, um, or do we say, I think we have to be a bit more selective about what we say he got right and what we think he, he got wrong or didn't, didn't go far enough with or didn't adequately develop what he dismissed too much from the past. Um, so he says, uh, I want to win acceptance through the inner truth of the subject matter. When I'm talking about self-consciousness, I want to convince you for science, that this is actually the right account of the development of self-consciousness and what's at the very basis of it by showing you 
the self-development of the notion by carrying out a phenomenology. Not a phenomenology just of you know, external experience, but a phenomenology of historical development, the development of consciousness. Um, likewise, when it comes to observing reason, or art, or religion, or morality, or any of these other things, I want to show you, by carrying out the work, what's really going on with these in the self-movement self of the notion. So he says, um, we must hold to the conviction it's of the nature of truth to prevail when its time has come. Another really interesting idea. What does it mean for truth to have a time that's come? Isn't truth eternal? Isn't truth always in existence? If something is true now, it was true back then. Is Hegel actually throwing himself into a kind of relativism, a kind of what we call historicism? Things, things are true now, but they weren't true back then, because truth varies from era to era or culture to culture. No, Hegel is saying... Um, you know, when it comes to certain truths, humanity's just not ready for them. And he's not doing this like a Gnostic. I am one of the knowers. The rest of you, you're not in on the secret, or a conspiracy theorist, or anything like that. Because remember, the, the proof of this is that you can get other reasonable people, not just other people in your conspiracy, to say, yeah, I think you're right. I think we're on the right track. We can be part of a community of inquiry. Is it possible that there are times that are not ready for certain truths? You know, a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, the Dark Ages, great example. They were, they were burning witches and, you know, engaging in all this sort of stuff. First off, the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages weren't quite as dark as a lot of people make them out to be. If you read some of the authors from that time, you realize that they actually held on to quite a bit of ancient civilization, and they were doing a lot of thinking at that time, our little movie portrayals and History Channel uh, caricatures of that time are actually dead off. The witch burning took place um, actually much later is when, when that sort of thing caught on. And that wasn't something that was just tied in with an anti-scientific viewpoint. There were a lot of other factors going on. And if you were going to take a Hegelian perspective on that sort of thing, it would require getting your fingers into the tissues of the past and reading these people and thinking, what was actually happening at these times? But were there certain truths that weren't available for that? Here's one example. Um, for Hegel, uh, freedom is something that develops over time. And so he, he talks about the importance of, in his view, Luther and the Protestant Reformation. He contrasts the ancient period, which was, you know, mainly aristocracies and tyrannies. There were democracies, but they quickly degenerated as teaching us the lesson that one man can be free, one person can be free. The Middle Ages showing us that um, some people can be free. And modernity is showing us that all can be free. That doesn't mean that all are free or all will be free. It can be, that that's a potential, that it's, it's possible. So these are truths that, that have to wait for the right time to come. The truth that philosophy is really supposed to be science, is really supposed to be dialectical development of the notion, knowing itself through time, etc., 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 you know, the Hegelian shtick, um, that's not a truth that was available in the time of Descartes, or in the time of Thomas Aquinas, or in the time of St. Augustine, or in the time of, of Plato, but it is a, a truth that's available coming on the heels of Kant, although Kant himself wasn't, wasn't quite ready for it. Um, and Hegel's the right guy, at the right time, in the right place, to make sense of it, to articulate it for us, and to, not, I don't want to say boil it down, but provide us its outlines here in this massive, dense tome that we're going to be working our way through. That's what he's talking about here in the preface. That's what he wants to end, uh, or come close to ending, the preface by, by talking about the, it is it's now time for this sort of project to be carried out he's saying so he says um, we must accept we must hold to the conviction it's the nature of truth to prevail when its time has come 
It appears only when the time has come and will never appear prematurely. Nor find a public, as I've got this term public here, not ripe to receive it. You can't have a lone genius. Hegel rejects that, that, that term genius, by the way. He thinks totally un, you know, unhelpful in these sort of respects. You can't just be the lone sage up on the hill. This is written for a public. This is written for not a reader, but a readership. It's supposed to be providing outlines that other people can take and use and go further with much the way Aristotle's books were, much the way Plato's dialogues were. So he says, um, We must accept that the individual needs that this should be so in order to verify what is yet a matter for him alone and to experience the conviction, which in the first place belongs only to a particular individual, as something universally held. So when these new truths come on the scene, People have to try them on and live them out. And they have to do that as individuals. They are going to be different than those in the rest of their society, sometimes even as representing you know, the highest that's available in their society. But they're going to be at odds with many others, and they are not necessarily going to find their friends, their, their readership, their appreciators in their own lifetime. But what they're tending towards is a universal community. This text is written for that universal community, which Hegel thinks is in the process of development. It has to be lived out individually first. There's a guy, Hegel, who has to actually be at the nexus of this and try to you know, have as little bit of himself involved in it as possible and just try to be sort of a vessel for world spirit, in his case. Um, which I think he did a pretty good job with. But it's ultimately heading towards something that's not just a bunch of clones of Hegel, not just a bunch of repeaters of Hegel's words and thoughts, but those who carry out a conversation, an ongoing, continuing to develop conversation, Hegelians. So he says, um, in this connection, he wants to give us a warning here, the public... The attitude of the public is quite different from, even contrary to, um, those who are its representatives and spokesmen. Now, who are the representatives and spokespeople of the public? The intelligentsia. The, in our case, um, the, the political class, um, the people in the universities, I suppose, probably not. Most of them, just, you know, you have more weight the higher tier you are. Um, the uh, people who get invited to TED Talks, you know, would be <laughs> among that as well for Hegel. Hegel would probably hate TED Talks, by the way. And we, there's a whole conversation we could have about that. Um, but, yeah, that's kind of an interesting digression to think about. Perhaps I'll blog about that. Um, who else? The, the elites. The, the people who claim to form public opinion the people who are opinion leaders, thought leaders. Hegel would say most of those people are full of it. They don't know what they're talking about. Any more than they did in Plato's time. Any more than when Socrates was saying, these are my older accusers, the people who, when I questioned, they couldn't actually say anything coherent about what it was that I was asking them, the things that they're supposed to know about. It's the same way in our own time, only the faces have changed. The titles have changed, and there's an awful lot more of them. But Hegel's writing not to them, but to the public that he has in mind. And he says, The public is inclined good-naturedly to blame itself when a philosophical work makes no appeal to it. When the public reads Hegel's phenomenology, and they don't make a lot of sense out of it, they don't say, Oh, crappy work, I couldn't understand it, so it must be garbage. They say, Oh, I wish I could. I wish I could understand this. I wish I was up to it. I, you know, I read through it and all this jargon. I, I just don't have the background for this. It's a question of actually putting the tools in the public's hand. That's part of what I'm trying to do with these videos, by the way. 
putting the tools in the public's hand to be able to make their way through this and appreciate it. And I'm willing, you know, I think that it's a good thing to do. So does Hegel with Descartes, with Heidegger, with, uh, you know, pick whoever you want who is an important thinker. The public is, is inclined to express a certain sort of humility and say, yeah, I understand this is important stuff, but I'm just not up to it. That you can do something with. That is docility. That's being able to be taught. That's what docility means. It comes from dokare, to teach. What about the, pub what about the public opinion uh, you know, representatives and spokespeople? When they look at a work, Hegel says, um, they are certain of their own competence. They put all the blame on the author when they don't understand it. So they've already got sort of a, not only a, a point of view staked out, but they believe that they're the arbiters. They're, they believe that if it doesn't make sense to them, it doesn't make sense at all. This is a certain kind of foolishness. It's not just a certain kind of pride and arrogance. It's a certain kind of foolishness to think that because one doesn't understand something, there's nothing there to be understood. This is something, by the way, that Plato and Aristotle both talked quite a bit about. You know, Aristotle says, there are some things that are, that are in themselves most self-evident. That doesn't mean they're self-evident to us, because we have to do some work to get there. And if we don't do the work, if we judge everything from our standpoint, we won't see the way that things really are in themselves, and the structure that they have, the connection that they have to each other. Anselm actually talks about that. He says, nothing is more foolish than somebody who thinks that simply because they don't understand something, it can't possibly be the case. And yet we see that as a criterion appealed to just as much in our own time as we do in Hegel's time. So he says, the effect of such a work on the public is more noiseless than the action of these dead men when they bury their dead. General level of insight, we're at a particularly opportune time, Hegel thinks, is now altogether more educated, its curiosity more awake, its judgment more swiftly reached, so that the feet of all those who will carry you out are already at the door. But from this we must all often distinguish the more gradual effect which corrects the attention extorted by imposing assurances and corrects to contemptuous censure coming from these guys, right? And gives some writers an audience only after a time while others have no audience left. There, there are many people in the history of philosophy who are only read by specialists, uh, in part because they're only worth reading by specialists, people who are really interested in that time period or needed something to, to write as an article for themselves to carve out. Um, there's a lot of people who you don't, you don't, frankly, you don't need to spend any time with because your time is limited, and you have to ask yourself, should I spend it with these guys, or should I spend it with Kant, or should I spend it with Plato, or should I spend it with, you know, if you want to pick a contemporary, Alistair McIntyre, um, or, you know, somebody else that I might get something out of, somebody who, from whom I'll come away with having learned something, something important. So Hegel's saying, look, my project, uh, you know, this is complicated stuff. This is, this is going to take some, some work to, to appreciate. Um, if you feel that you're not up to it, I will help you along the way. I'm giving you the outlines of it. It's, it takes some work, but if you're the public, that's fine. These guys over here are going to take a look at my work and say, this is not any good. We don't, don't, they're going to say to the public, don't spend time on this, this, this joker, because he doesn't make any sense, and, you know, he's violating the law of non-contradiction and, and dispensing with all philosophical rigor, not realizing that he's expressing a higher rigor. And he's saying that that's probably where my time currently is. As it turns out, like I said, Hegel is wrong about that. Um, he catches on uh, quite well and keeps going on uh, like gangbusters for decades after his death. And then is, is greatly eclipsed uh, until the early 20th century when he's, again, recovered and uh, people start taking him quite seriously again. Um, but he's saying that now it, it's the time for the issue to be decided. Whether he's right or wrong about his reception, um, he is right about 
what is going on in his reception and what it has to tell us about the nature of the public, the nature of the elites, and the nature of philosophy itself. For the rest, at a time when the universality of spirit has gathered such strength and the singular detail as is fitting has become correspondingly less important, when to that universal aspect claims and holds on to the whole range of the wealth it has developed, the share in the total work of spirit which falls to the individual can only be very small. Because of this, the individual must all the more forget himself as the nature of science implies and requires. Of course, he must make of himself and achieve what he can. But less must be demanded of him, just as he in turn can expect less of himself and may demand less for himself. In section 72, Hegel is bringing the preface to the phenomenology to a close. It's a very short section. He's actually not saying an awful lot in that section that's particularly memorable because of, you know, well-phrased, uh, lapidary sentences that we, we bring up, like the patience and the labor of the negative, but it is important. And what we want to ask ourselves, so this is the end of the preface. This is the end of sort of, the, here's what I'm doing in this work. Here's how I want you to think about it. Here's all the different traps that you can fall into. Is this really now the start of the work as such? You might say, well, it's got to be, because we've been doing all this preliminary stuff up until this time. But notice what's going to happen after this. He's immediately following the preface with an introduction, an Einführung which is important. He's going to start treating some of these issues now that he's put on the table in a little bit more rigorous, a little bit deeper fashion. And then he's going to start looking at, at consciousness and then the grand march of spirit begins. Now, one of the things that he does close with, this is very interesting, because you can see here just precisely what it is, say, that the existentialists are reacting against in reacting against Hegel. He's asking, what's the role of the individual? I capitalized it, he doesn't capitalize it, or the translator does it, rather. What is the, the role of the individual in this? Well, notice he's saying, this is a time when the universality of spirit has gathered such strength. We're at an opportune time in history because we do have a, a growing you know, widening, better and better educated, more literate, more thoughtful public. Um, he's writing this, by the way, at the time of the Napoleonic Wars, when Europe is becoming possibly one giant state. We're, right, we're at a time when the universality of spirit has gathered such strength, and the singular detail has become less important. The singular node within the, the whole system, the whole matrix, has become less important than seeing the big picture. He says, when that it's fitting, uh, or uh, that universal aspect claims and holds on to the whole range of the wealth it's developed, the share in the total work of spirit which falls to the individual can only be very small. So the individual, here's again where Hegel is going to you either love him or hate him. You're going to, to see this as, as, as you know, his uh, decisive turning point to what, what's you know, most on track or where he goes most wrong. The individual fits into the system. And their, their role matters because of its participation within, its enmeshing within the system of other individuals. So he says, because of this, the individual must all the more forget himself. If you want to understand the Hegelian perspective, it's sort of like stargazing. You know, if you want to stargaze, you look at the sky and you got to like relax a bit and quit thinking about, did I leave the, the toaster on, you know, or what am I doing next week, or stuff like that, and just look at the stars and see this totality. You don't sit there and say, one, two, three, <laughs> you know, or 
Um, just look for the constellations. Ah, hi, I found the Big Dipper. Ah, oh, there's Scorpio. No, you, you, you let yourself, you let the phenomenon impinge upon you. Hegel's saying that when it comes to this, this scientific aspect of things, you know, a community of inquiry, that's how we need to do it. Does that mean we all become worker drones? Uh, no, because there's a certain kind of freedom involved in this and not a, not a you know, mere necessity. But he says that the individual must forget himself as the nature of science implies and requires. Of course he must make of himself and achieve what he can, that's, that's not to say that, you know, we just take our cues entirely from the system. We still require some individual initiative, some enterprise, some willingness to jump in. You have to apply your own brains and develop your own will. But you're doing it within a context. He says less must be demanded of him, just as he can in turn expect less of himself and may demand less for himself. One way of seeing this is despite the fact that we have something like an intellectual hero and you know a great work here in the phenomenology and then to follow that's going to be the science of logic all these brilliant lectures that he's going to do finally you know the philosophy of right the encyclopedia logic Hegel saying the time of heroes intellectual heroes is drawing to a close we don't need them anymore what we need is the system what we need is the, the patience to work through this, to make sense of it. So that's how he's ending the preface to the phenomenology. Not on a bombastic note, but fairly quietly, in an unassuming way, inviting us to take part in reading the rest of this, this great work. So, um, I'll say just uh, a few things now that this portion of the lecture is over. If you've been watching all of these, uh, that's really great. Um, this is a, like I said at the beginning, this is a work that I am I'm, you know, very excited to, to speak about. Um, I'm probably um, not the, uh, the, the best person to, to do these videos, but I'm the only person actually doing it. So, you know, although there are greater uh, and much brighter and much more versed Hegel commentators than I am, um, I'm, I'm the one who actually was, was crazy enough to take on this task. I hope that you'll stick with this. I hope that you're in, not only enjoying these lectures, but that it's helping you to go to the text. I don't particularly care if you're using this translation or not. Um, if you want to use, you know, the new Pinker translation that's coming out, or you want to use the Miller translation or the Finlay translation, more power to you. What I care about is people actually reading the text because of these lectures. So um, we're going to do more of these. Next is going to be the introduction. Then we're going into consciousness in those three sections. I'm not sure how long it'll take. But um, in any case, glad that you've come along this far with me. And we've got a lot of really exciting vistas to, to climb to and to look out over the whole history of human consciousness from.